Okay. So welcome everybody. My name is Rena Rachel Galper, founder and director of our Sacred Circles, here with you to have a conversation with my dear friend and colleague who will introduce herself. Um, so my name is Natalie Bullock Brown. I'm a professor, assistant professor, actually a teaching assistant professor of women's and gender studies and um, Africana studies and sometimes film at uh, North Carolina State University. Um, but my passion and my, my, my full time vision for myself is as a filmmaker. Fabulous. So I'm honored that we are together today and the purpose is to have a conversation of a community conversation and in order to do that we actually have to bring in the communities that are ours, our ancestors, our, um, our guides, our guardians, spirit, however we understand it. And so what I want to do is I want to begin with just a grounding where we take a moment with eyes closed and just get ourselves centered and grounded. So just breathing, just gentle, unforced breath. Breathing in and as we exhale, we send our roots down into the earth. bringing into us the energy and the protection and grounding of the soil. Sending our roots down deeper still to the underground rivers. Breathing in, we drink up those waters to mix with, to mix with our blood and waters within our bodies. going down deeper still to the spaces in between the great rocks that hold our planet together, the crystal caves, breathing in this clear air from the spaces between to mix with our breath. and sending our roots down deeper still to the core of the world, the golden warmth and molten, and bringing up that golden energy into our being. And sending it out to all in need of renewal, of healing, and reaching the branches of our tree of life upward to connect with the tree of life from the heavens reaching down to meet us. We feel also the wind and the rain and the earth and the lightning connected above and below feeling how our roots and branches touch and connect with countless others, past, present, and future. All of our sacred circles, all of the energies that are with us for this moment. And with that, I would invite both of us to call in the energies that we want to be present our communities of choice, of blood, past, present, and future, and all of the energies that are here to guide us. So I would like to invite in my healthy ancestors, those who have fought for justice and healing, ancestors of blood and of choice. I invite in all of the angels of protection and healing and love and righteousness. I invite in all of the revolutionaries, past, present, and future, 
all of the healers, the creatives, the empaths, all those on this path of spiritual warriorship and prophetic work. And Natalie, if there's anyone you would like to invite in, now would be a great time. And these can be people that are live and past and maybe yet to be born. Yeah. So um, I am inviting in this, the, the energy and spirit of Angela Davis. And I am also inviting in the spirits of my great grandmother on my mother's side and her mother and my grandmother on my father's side and her mother and all of my ancestors on both sides who endured slavery, who fought so that um, my immediate family, my extended family could be born and exist. And I call in the spirits of my grandchildren and great grandchildren, if my children decide to have children, mm -hmm. but all of those children who are yet to be born, who already have, have that light, that seed of of activism, of advocacy, of revolution in them, um, who will um, answer the call and the charge to change this world into what it has the potential to be. I would also like to invo invoke my Kohenet priestess tribe, um, many of whom will listen to this recording after. I invoke my mother who has spent a half a century at least dedicated to the fight for justice on so many, in so many realms. To my grandmother Sonia who single-handedly saved her family in the face of the enemy in Russia and brought them here without which I would not have been born. And to Naomi Klein and so many current prophets whose work and wisdom guide my way. And also to our, to our animals, our animal companions, um, from whom I am always inspired and learn so much. Welcome. That's it. So uh, what I would like to do is uh, Natalie and I, for those of you that are tuning into this, actually had an amazing conversation uh, when she was walking, taking care of herself, which is so important, and I was on the video, so we didn't record it, but I wanted to just take a couple of moments to summarize what we were talking about. And Natalie, please feel free to jump in at any moment. Sure. So I think what brought us to this was realizing that we are being called to, to step in and do our work in the world in a different way. Um, I view that as the work of being a prophetic voice or a prophetess. How would you describe what you feel called to step into in this moment? Um, I feel uh, like my call is to speak truth to power and to um, make knowledge accessible, um, the type of liberating knowledge uh, or the type of knowledge that liberates. Um, I think it's part of the reason why I'm a, a professor and that I teach the courses that I teach um, because the information that I am privileged to be able to share with students often sets them free in a variety of ways and, and they come back and tell me that. And, and it's um, really a gift to be able to um, participate in that process. Uh, Cause I so wish that um, even though I had amazing professors when I was in college and certainly in grad school, I don't remember like a lot of the information that has been useful to me as I've sought to grow and evolve, you know, I wasn't, it just was not available. I 
wasn't being exposed to it for whatever reason. It didn't come until much later in life. So I'm excited for the possibilities that exist when young people in their, you know, in their late teens, early 20s are exposed to information that can begin them on a process that can lead to, you know, incredible things happening. Well, and I think, you know, like you, as someone who's been an educator of younger folks, um, you know, K through 12, I think that my prophetic work has been to also open the doors for them to understand what liberatory anti-oppression learning and teaching can actually look like. And also, yeah. which is my ordination name, also means joy in Hebrew. And so I think joy is a powerful force in really helping people to learn and to grow. I also, and I shared this with you before, feel, you know, I received a message before this call about needing to reconcile these parts of my nature. There's the warrior part of me, which is very often fueled by anger and righteousness at what to me is a deliberate, ongoing, and historically consistent process of um, power mongering and destruction of people, particularly black and brown and poor people everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and this part of me that is a healer, that is motivated by love and a desire to connect and that these warring parts of my nature in order to become a spiritual warrior, that I have to be guided by love um, and not by the ego that I think in many ways has ensured my survival up until this moment. So I think I'm being yeah, but different. And I would love to hear from you about what, how you're, you know, sitting with this. I, I, I didn't mean to um, interrupt you, but I, I really um, appreciate what you're talking about in terms of this war between, you know, the side of you that is a warrior. Um, because I think a warrior spirit is fueled by anger, a, a righteous anger at injustice, at wanting to see things made right um, and then you know um, a spirit of love that I think empaths have um, you know the, it, that's fueled by compassion and and wanting to see people made whole and wanting to help people to get there and and what have you um, I feel like um, both of those sides um, can coexist but it, it, the 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 journey is walking that line that allows enough anger and outrage and you know um the that fire to work with the love the compassion and the empathy that that is a challenge um but i think like i wouldn't be motivated to do a lot of what i do um you know, I, I wouldn't be motivated to do my film or to um, pursue anything that results in some sort of social justice, um, uh, an issue of social justice being addressed without that fire and anger that propels me to say, until this is better, I'm going to be angry, I'm going to be outraged, I'm going to want to see things change. Um, so. I, you know, I, I feel you on that, that, that there's uh, a lot there that we have to navigate. Can you tell us briefly about your film? Sure. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it's so funny to talk about it now because it, I see it very differently today than I did when you saw it, like what, four years ago, five years ago? But I'm doing a documentary, um, I've been working on it since 2015, maybe longer than that, but um, certainly the manifestation of it, like it began to come together in 2015, and it explores the historical context and social impact of the beauty standard, the white beauty standard on black women and girls. And it is a first person narrative, which just means that it tells I tell my story as sort of the guiding force through looking at the issues that surround um, the white beauty standard. Um, you know, everything from stereotypes about stereotypes and caricatures about black women and girls to white supremacy and racism and how all of these forces, even patriarchy and um, misogyny certainly, um, inform how black women and girls process 
the messages that we're given every day, it's like an onslaught of messaging that says we're, you know, not good enough. We don't look good. We're ugly. We, you know, don't deserve certain things. We're not valuable. We're not protected. Like, and all of this stuff works together to, you know, in many instances become internalized in us where we then believe these things about ourselves. So it is a first person narrative that I'm trying to tell because it, I, I have gone through, I am going through a process that I'm hoping will free someone, um, help someone to not have to struggle in the same ways that I, I have um, with, you know, just the, the ramifications of not feeling beautiful, not feeling attractive um because it's much deeper than you know like the surface of well am i pretty and you know my no like all of that matters but it's really about the sort of decision the the the, the decisions that come out of the vulnerability that results when someone is not feeling good about themselves and that's real and it needs to be addressed well, and, you know, before we recorded, we also talked about the power of narratives, right? And not only, you know, we're in, we're in a, a, a white dominant, a white supremacist culture, which values the individual over the collective, which values youth over age, men over women, white over people of color, like lots of, um, you know, just so many fierce dichotomies, which just serve to consolidate power of a few over the many. Yeah. And there were also these personal narratives, which I, we talked about, like they get encoded in our being and passed on narratives, yes. not enoughness of feeling um, afraid to be powerful, of feeling afraid yes. to speak. Our, yeah. You know, when we talked about spiritual warriorship and being a prophetic voice, and, you know, I feel this fierce need to do visioning along with mobilization as an individual, but also in a collective, which is so discouraged in our culture. <laughs> it's true. Um, that's why we're our sacred circles, because there's all these circles, which I hope will intersect. But I think what's interesting is that, you know, part of the work that we're talking about is that we have to actually be aware of those narratives and heal them and know that we have a choice to weave different narratives that will serve us better than the ones that have allowed us to survive up until this moment, perhaps, but are certainly no longer useful. And some of them probably never were, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's so uh, necessary that we are aware of the narratives because as you said, like, I mean, reality is we can't do anything about a narrative that we're not aware of you know, there, there's a level of intentionality that has to take place when you are trying to shift a narrative, change a narrative, you know, purposely replace a negative, um, destructive narrative with one that is life-giving and that is truthful, right? And I think, you know, when I think about how um, the systems in this country in particular have been so effective in dividing and conquering, you know, like I, it, it's even in this moment, I'm realizing more than I think I did before how that spirit of, you know, American individualism, rugged individualism, like that actually supports, you know, a, a way of being and living that then when something like this happens, we're scared we're scurrying because we don't know, we haven't been trained, we're, we're not in communion, I guess, with the people and the skills that would allow us to come together and do what's necessary to, you know, to block this. And I think with each, um, I mean, I think unfortunately for black folks, like we, we lost so much <laughs> through integration I mean, integration needed to happen, right? It, there, it, but it's really not integration as much as equality. It, it, we needed to have separate, separate but equal would have worked, right? For to a certain degree, but separate but separate but equal would have also allowed for a way 
forward to integrate on um, equal terms. Integration absolutely is necessary. I mean, it, it, it's just the reality. We are all connected. We can't really live without each other. But this country does a number on us in making us think that we're not connected. You don't need anybody. You know, this whole pull yourself up by your bootstraps would have you think that it's only by your own merit and your own goodness and your own powerful, your, your own power that you're able to do anything and you can pull yourself, um, you know, into whatever, whatever prosperity, whatever space of, of, of affirmation or goodness or, you know, um, the things that you are seeking, I'll, really, I'll say, in your life that you can do that on your own and it's a lie. And so to address that um, and help all of us to understand the ways that we have been lied to and we're continually lied to so that we can just stop, you know, stop that voice, those voices that are telling us something that is not, that doesn't serve us. I think it's so important. Um, and I think that's part of the challenge though, is just how do you, how do you, expose people to the information that has helped you um, when you can't really control who can receive it and who can't, you know, that, that's like the, mm, the thing that is hard to reckon with. Well, and I think, um, you know, one of the things about Zoom conferencing like this is there's been, you know, obviously, some security issues which have led Zoom to tighten up its security because there's been some hacking. And yet I feel as a way of my sort of controlling and also accepting my lack of control over who sees this, I have chosen to freely release the Zoom information to friends and their friends um, without some of those security measures, because I think it's important for those lines of communication to be open, um, which, yeah. you know, it increases the risk, and yet it's a necessary risk, I think. Yeah. I also, yeah. You know, I also want to say that there are people, and we spoke about this, who have been visioning and speaking truth and mobilizing within communities forever, yeah. Yeah. forever. And I think my particular focus has been white folks whose privilege has separated them from everything else and given them a sense that, oh, if you work hard, uh, then you get what you deserve and everybody who doesn't get it probably didn't deserve it. Like there's so many narratives around privilege and around access to power and around who should be speaking and who should be leading. And, um, and I feel, you know, part of my work as a prophetic voice is to really work with white people um, around power, around shared leadership, around breaking down narratives personally and collectively that I think really don't serve us anymore. Um, and we also talked about just being exhausted, right? <laughs> just being absolutely exhausted. Like how do we do this visioning when there's so many urgent things that require our attention? Yeah, we talked about how everything is so urgent and life threatening for so many that even if we're not in that place, that we're still attending to those needs and we're in the midst of what is absolutely a hostile takeover. Yeah, our consolidation. So how do we renew ourselves as empaths, as healers, as teachers? You know, what are your thoughts on that? How do we renew and keep going? Well, I mean. I, I, you know, so I want to shout out Angel Dozier, who has taught me um, a lot, like in the past week, um, uh, just about, you know, what that looks like and where it starts. And I believe that what she has um, said, I mean, she, so let me back up. Angel did a Oracle reading earlier this week and then she <laughs> did my um my astrological chart for me uh friday um 
which I'm going to just acknowledge is really, it, 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 it's amazing um, because it, everything that she said, like everything that she shared with me was so on point and just read, like I wanted, I almost wanted to shout, <laughs> which is funny because I, coming from a Christian um, tradition, astrology is not uh, the way to go, right? You know, like that is almost heathen worship, right? Pagan worship. Um, but I, I, the older I get and the more I learn, the more I believe that all of these things, like there is no disunity between the, what the moon and the sun are telling us and what God is trying to speak to, what the spirit world is trying to talk, tell us, what the universe is trying to tell us. I think it's all connected and I'm open to all of it. Because I believe that, I mean, I feel like I need the guidance and I want to be open to it wherever it comes from. Um, so Angel, you know, has emphasized that it really, you know, when we start thinking about our destiny, like what our purpose is and how we live that out, it starts with us really going deep inside. And sometimes that takes us to dark places um, you know, but when we're able to contend with those dark places in ourselves, it helps us to grow and evolve and transform in ways that then, you know, spread out and, and actually touch other people. And so I think that that is, you know, I was sharing with you and, and we were in agreement on this, that I think the pandemic as horrific as it is, is a... It, it's a moment to really go deep, you know, to turn inward and to listen and to hear what, you know, is being whispered to us in terms of what we need to do now. Like, how, how can I become a better person? How can I take better care of myself? How can I improve the relationships around me? Um, how can I remove myself from the destructive systems that I, you know, I've, prior to the pandemic, I was, uh, you know, I was motivated by, like, how do I, how do I develop a healthy relationship with capitalism? How do I stop the grind? You know, how do I, you know, actually pay attention to my body and, and stop and rest and, you know, do the things that are replenishing instead of, working myself to the ground, you know, all of that, I think, is fair game in this moment. Um, and so I think that that is the way forward is that we we've all got to do that work. The work is internal, the work externally is not going to happen in a way that's going to be effective. I don't think if we don't get ourselves right uh, on the inside. And, and that, you know, that it, it's, it's work. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. And it's, it's work that's often painful and scary and um, it doesn't feel good. You know, um, maybe we feel like we're taking three steps back before we're able to take a step forward, but it is so worth it when we keep persisting in, you know, just meeting ourselves where we are and contending with what we see and being willing to see it, the good, the bad, and the ugly and deal with it so that we can heal and move on. Well, and I think, you know, one of the things that really struck me, because I think it's not an either or, right? Like I find myself in a place where I have to do that inner work and I have to do it consistently. And I also have to um, vision and mobilize with people who are concretely working to create a revolution right now in the face of an absolute hostile takeover which is deliberately genocidally killing people everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah. for me, it's also that balance between the inner and the outer, which I find challenging. Yeah, but you're right. Back to that individualist narrative, that sometimes makes me feel alone, which in turn makes me feel exhausted and afraid. And so to the degree that I'm able to cultivate connections with the unseen world, with all of the energies mm -hmm. that work with me, with all of the people in the flesh who I love, 
is the extent to which I have the energy to actually persevere. Yeah. I'm, I don't believe that there is a healthy relationship to capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> We're kind of done with that. Yeah, I, I mean, as I was saying it, I was like, is there one? I don't know, there, you know, but I mean, I, I feel like we, we all, like money is necessary. It's just the, you know, the, the way that this culture has, it, it, it really goes back to the way that this country came into being, right? And, and the backs of black folks being used to build a system of capitalism and the ways that other bodies of color have been you know put through the grinder to feed that system you know that is what has to stop that's the destructive nature and 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 the fact that in many instances we do not get anything like i'm giving all this to this system and i'm not really getting anything in return that will help sustain me it's depleting me but it's not reinforcing me so i i feel you i i, I don't know what that again that balance is well and i think it's not only is it depleting us but it's also depleting the earth it's just like yes. yeah it's depleting yeah i want to give a shout out to migrant roots uh run by roxana because they they're actually have been doing incredible book studies like Beyond Border Imperialism. They're gonna be studying the shock doctrine by Naomi Klein. So, you know, really helping to get a foundation which enables me to see the whole picture. Um, I also wanna say something about the dark places that you spoke of because even in the use of that word dark, which for so many white folks like myself has been equated with dangerous, evil, <laughs> Like we have color associations, right? <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I have to tell you, as an educator, yeah. there is not a day that goes by where I do not have to confront people's resistance to the beauty of black and the use of it in art. I mean, it's profound. And so when I think going into, I try to reframe instead of dark places in this negative sense to view it. And I think I mentioned this to you, this womb of seeding of this womb where I get to go into the depths of what drives me as a human, including the uncomfortable and abused um, And also uh, to see it as a place of seeding from which everything can grow. Um, and I also know that our time is limited and that you and I have another phone call. So I wanna be very respectful of your time too and just say that this is just the beginning of what I hope will be a conversation with many one at a time or 50 at a time where we can really support and hold one another in this powerful work. Absolutely. I, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful to have had the, the chance to talk to you today, both, you know, as I was walking and, and now, and um, I'm, I, I just want to uh, underscore and affirm what you said about, you know, doing the personal individual work at the same time that you are in communion with people who can really basically hold space for you while you're doing that and while they're doing it um, because it is necessary um, to have that um, community um, because you 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 uh, learn from each other you gain um, strength and support from each other and all of that I, I mean it's very uh, I'd, I'm not sure I would be able to get through the hard part, the challenging part, without knowing that there are other people going through it with me or there are people that I can go to when I'm, you know, hurting or, you know, confused or whatever I'm struggling with and, and you know, and hear them say, you know, I feel you, I, it's okay, I've been there, I understand, or I'm going through the same thing, you know, we can walk through it together. Yeah. Well, so with that, I just, um, I want to offer a blessing to everyone who will see this video, um, just to say that, um, that I love you and that this work continues and that we are all in it together as much as we're able to feel that and blessings in the struggle and in the healing and the warriorship in the love in everything. And um, if you're, so I want to just show you something quickly.
um, because this is also a way to say thank you to those that we invoked at the beginning of the call. It's a call out to all of you, but also a thanks to all of the energetic presences. And we say, you know, stay if you will, go if you must. Um, but please, you know, accept this. This was gifted to me by a friend of mine. Mm -hmm, that's beautiful. It is similar to a shofar, which we use in Jewish tradition. However, it is a conch, which is also used as a distress call and a call to mobilize. So I thought I would just play it up. Yeah. <laughs> it's a blessing and a goodbye to all of us. That's amazing. You, you, of course, <laughs> what comes to mind is the scene in um, the Ten Commandments when the children of Israel are leaving <laughs> Egypt and heading towards the uh, the Red Sea. But I mean, it's that's such a powerful image, as as you know, as contrived as it may be. But it's just the power of you blowing that and what it symbolizes is a calling forth, you know, and, and a mobilizing and a unifying uh, sound and force. And I love that. That's, that's perfect. Well, amen. I love you. And love you too. Continue. Okay. Bye.